Haig, uh, the director of the architecture program here at Benedictine College. And I am delighted to present to you on behalf of the honors program and the Gregorian Fellows tonight's special guest uh, to our campus, to Atchison, to Kansas, from New York, Mr. Ignat Solzhenitsyn, the son of Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Recognized as one of today's most gifted artists and enjoying an active career as both conductor and pianist, Ignat Solzhenitsyn's lyrical and poignant interpretations have won him critical acclaim throughout the world. In 2021-22, Mr. Sol Solzhenitsyn returns to the Bolshoi Theater to lead La Clemenza di Tito and One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich, both of which he conducted at their production premieres. He also returns to the National Philharmonic of Russia and gives solo recitals in Prague, Copenhagen, and St. Petersburg. The principal guest conductor of the Moscow Symphony, orchestra and conductor laureate of the Chamber Orchestra of Philadelphia, Ignat Solzhenitsyn is much in demand as a guest conductor, having recently led the symphonies of Baltimore, Buffalo, Cincinnati, Dallas, Indianapolis, Milwaukee, Nashville, Phoenix, Seattle, and Toronto. The list continues. Take a breath. Czech National Symphony, as well as many of the major orchestras in Russia, including the Mariinsky Orchestra and St. Petersburg Philharmonic, the Moscow Philharmonic, and the Moscow Symphony. He has partnered with such world-renowned soloists as Richard Good, Gary Grafman, Stephen Isulis, Gideon Kramer, Sylvia McNair, Anne-Sophie Mutter, Garrick Olson, Mitslav Rostropovich, and Mitsuko Uchida. In recent seasons, his extensive touring schedule in the United States and Europe has included concerto performances with numerous major orchestras, including those in Boston, uh, Chicago, and we will run down the list of, of uh, cities into Australia, into Canada, and with collaborations with such distinguished conductors as Herbert Blomstedt, James Conlon, James DePriest, Charles Troy, Lawrence Foster, Valery Gergiev, Christoph Penderecki, and Andre Previn, Mitslav Rostropovich, Gerhard Schwartz, Wolfgang Savlich, Maxim Shostakovich, Yuri Tirmikhanov, and David Zinman. In addition to his recital appearances in the United States at New York's 92nd Street, Y, and Philadelphia's Kimmel Center, St. Paul's Ordway Theater, Ann Arbor's Hill Auditorium, Salt Lake City's Abravanel Hall, San Francisco's Arabs Theater, and many others from coast to coast, Mr. Solzhenitsyn has also given numerous recitals in Europe and the Far East in such major musical centers as London, Milan, Zurich, Moscow, Tokyo, and Sydney. An avid chamber musician, Mr. Solzhenitsyn has collaborated with the Emerson, Borodin, Brentano, and St. Petersburg String Quartets, and in forehand recital with Mitsuko Uchida. He has frequently appeared at international festivals, including in Salzburg, Evian, Ludwigsburg, Claremore, Ojai, Marlboro, Nizhny, Novgorod, and Moscow's famed December evenings. A winner of the Avery Fisher Career Grant, Ignat Solzhenitsyn serves on the faculty of the Curtis Institute of Music. He has been featured on many radio and television specials, including CBS Sunday Morning and ABC's Nightline. Born in Moscow, Mr. Solzhenitsyn resides in New York City. After all of that musical experience, tonight he comes to share with us stories written by his father, and stories of his father and his family. I happily present to you Mr. Ignat Solzhenitsyn. Thank you, Ben. Thank you so much that introduction, John, and uh, wonderful to see all of you tonight, and thank you for coming uh, for uh, maybe an unusual evening. I'm going to read to you, as you know, a couple of my father's works, and I thought we should, before I do that, just have a quick recapitulation for those of you who know, and maybe introduction for those of you who may not, uh, what Solzhenitsyn was as a, as a writer, is, as a writer, and where these little miniatures fit in his artistic 
legacy. Solzhenitsyn is certainly a novelist. In the first circle, the beloved novel of uh, set in a, a confined environment, often a prison, uh, is, is a, a, a remarkable work that uh, seeks to, uh, in depicting the, 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 the growth of its characters, uh, Volodyan and Nirjan in particular, uh, seeks to show how much inner freedom is possible uh, even for people restricted by, by, by space and restricted by, by fiat and by, by the circumstances of their life. The, the other great novel, uh, if his output, Cancer Ward, about purportedly about what happens to people and to individuals when faced with cancer, when faced with a terminal disease. All of a sudden, everything that just yesterday mattered so much in our lives, all of a sudden, doesn't matter. And what we face becomes overwhelmingly important. And we see how certain characters learn too late and certain ones just in time that what they should have paid attention to earlier in their lives is, is now coming, coming home to roost. Uh, Solzhenitsyn is certainly a playwright. He has a trilogy of plays, 1945, uh, which the first one is set, Prussian, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, Victory Feast or Victory Celebrations in English translation, uh, set at the front where he himself was fighting with the Soviet army in spring of 45 and earlier. And then prisoners set uh, in prison and then uh, the love girl and the innocent set in the camps. And, and the v vast experience that's, that's on display in just a short period of months uh, for many, many people like himself who went, in his case, from a captain in the army to a prisoner to uh, a, a kind of slave in the camps. Solzhenitsyn is certainly a historian, and as such, and as, as, an, as a novelist, uh, created two of the most unusual works in uh, 20th century literature, the Gulag Archipelago and the Red Wheel. And just to remind you that the Gulag Archipelago, of course, is, is on the surface of it, a political statement, a, an expose of the crimes of the uh, communist regime in the Soviet Union. But uh, it is not, and it couldn't have been a, uh, a treatise or a purely historical document, uh, if only because none of the materials were available uh, for him to research for obvious reasons. So the Gulag Archipelago is subtitled an experiment in literary investigation, which is obviously an unusual term. And uh, his feeling was that uh, the only way that he, at any rate, could tell the story, and by the way, not just his story, but the story of 227 other eyewitnesses who, and survivors of these camps, was uh, not through a, a work of history, per se, but a work of uh, that, that is best described as an epic and a work that combines elements of, of, of historical representation, elements of polemical discussion, uh, and most importantly with uh, artistic insight into, uh, into the human condition that really only uh, a great writer ultimately can, can furnish. Solzhenitsyn is also a poet, although not in a conventional sense, because he did not think of himself as a poet. I uh, did not aspire or, or uh, to, the, uh, to the title uh, of, of, a, of a poet. Uh, but he began to, con to compose poetry in earnest simply as a means to survive, to survive as a human being and to find some way for his work to survive, meaning that in the camps, when he found himself there, nothing was allowed, no books were allowed, uh, really nothing, anything you can think of was not allowed, including pencil and paper. 
And so how is a writer supposed to write without pencil and paper? He can write poetry and memorize it. And all of Solzhenitsyn's published poems, there are a couple of juvenilia pieces from, uh, for, really from his youth that, that, that uh, have not been published and probably won't be, uh, but, uh, but all of his published poems come from exclusively from that time when he was arrested in 1945 and uh, through his camp, eight years of camps until 53 and then the three years of exile from 53 to 56, exile internally in the Soviet Union on the edge of the desert in Kazakhstan, a little village called Kokterek. Uh, and he continued to write some poems there because it was still exceedingly unsafe to put anything on paper there, especially in the, before, in the first months of, uh, after Stalin died, when it was far from clear what direction things would go, and it wasn't yet clear that there was going to be a certain kind of a lightening of the, of the atmosphere in the Soviet Union. And so uh, these poems are a remarkable testament to what he had seen and, and survived, uh, but also a testament to the power of human memory and, and, and the power of, uh, of the mind, of, of mind over matter. And he says early on in, 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 the, in, the, in, in the, the poem, I don't have it here in English to quote, but that uh, he's standing in front of his, in front of his, in front of the guards waiting to be counted. Like they were counted four times a day, every day, to make sure that not a single prisoner escaped. And he's standing to be counted in the cold, in the dark, and, 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 and thinking, go ahead, do, do your darndest. You know, search me, there's nothing, you won't find anything, because you can't search my memory. And my memory has, has everything, has, has all of it contained 9,000 lines of poetry. He re remembered that he did not go crazy, uh, he survived, and he did set down in paper, and so we have, we have that. Uh, we'll leave aside, uh, of course, speeches, essays, and all those things, and we've already covered some of, the, some, uh, some of those uh, aspects of his output uh, earlier today, so I don't want to repeat for those of you who were there, but I just very much want to focus on the, uh, on the artistic side of Solzhenitsyn, the most important side. And so then we come to something that has been called prose poems, not by him, I'd like you to know that. Uh, it's not a bad characterization, and you can judge for yourselves, but he called them krokhetki, which is very difficult to translate into English. Uh, little things, little tiny things. That's what it, it means. It's not a literary term, it's just it could be about anything. It could be, actually, it could be, could be about, about, about little kids, or it could be about little things. Uh, and so the closest, uh, it seems, what we can come is miniatures. Miniature thing, miniature anything. Uh, but uh, the other p possibility is, is prose poems, and you'll, you'll see why. The circumstances of their coming to, to, to life are, I think, not uninteresting. Solzhenitsyn was born in the south. Or she was born in Kislovodsk, raised in Rostov, the southern Rostov. And as he became a student and an adult and, and truly uh, came to love his own culture, meaning the, the Russian cultural heritage, he also, through so much of the great Russian poetry, Tuchev and Nikrasov and Pushkin and Lermontov, and the list goes on and on, and not to mention, of course, the pr prose writing as well, he came to love, at, from a distance, the Russian heartland, the Russian north, the kind of central, central Russia. We, by the way, we think of Russia as a massive place, and, and it is, by any standard of square miles, square kilometers, and time zones, and all the rest of it. But culturally and, 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 and historically, the, the kind of the Russian heartland is not that big. It, it really isn't. It's certainly European Russia, not Asian. Russia, and then even within European Russia, it's, it's for example, Rostov, where he grew up, is, is not, not culturally 
so relevant to Russian, to Russian history, to Russian art, to Russian architecture, and all the rest of it. So uh, this Russian heartland is, 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 I think most people would agree, kind of, well, that's why it's called heartland. And, 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 and one could say perhaps the same thing in this country, where, where the, the heart of the country lies. He didn't have a chance to actually know that Russia physically, in, personally, until much later in life. Because, as I said, he's, he was in the South, and he went to university there. Then the war, he volunteered to fight. He fought in Belarus and Poland and, and East Prussia, uh, and, and that's where the war was. And then when he was arrested, he was taken to Moscow for his secret trial, and then, then to the camps, and the camps were always far, far, far away in the frozen northeast, in, the, in, the, in Kazakhstan, which is also a very cold place. And, and certainly, he, he was not in Russia. And so after the eight years of camps, and after, th what, three years of exile, which was supposed to be perpetual and only was cut short because Stalin died and things started to change, uh, s finally he was able to, for the first time in his life, okay, go, go anywhere you want. Of course, in the Soviet Union, it's always you still have to get the permission to live and you have to get a registration. You can't just, just go anywhere you want, but he could try to go anywhere. And he thought, well, what? I, that, that, and he didn't have anybody in the world. He didn't have any, any, anybody left. And he thought, well, so where, I can go anywhere. I'd like, to go, I'd like to go to that Russia and see if it's what it's cracked up to be. And that's what he did. And so he went to, to, to a small village in, in, near Rizan, uh, you know, not, not, too, not far from, from, from Moscow, to, to 200 miles, uh, not even. And uh, he settled there. And by the way, the amazing story Matrona's home is uh, based on the peasant woman that he, where he rented a room, from whom he rented a room in, uh, in this little village, and who is the the real life Matrona of Matrona's home, one of the most extraordinary characters uh, I think that you'll ever meet. And he began to know the, the real Russia. And then, it, 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 fast forward a bit, uh, and he's living also not far from there, in, in actually in the design, and uh, which itself is nothing to, nothing that, uh, is particularly impressive or, or, or uh, noteworthy about the design, uh, generally speaking, I think, in Russia. Uh, but uh, being based there, he was able to take, to start to travel. They actually travel for leisure uh, in the summers, maybe during su summertime, basically, it was in the summers. Uh, he was a school teacher, so he had the summers off. And during those summers, he would take bicycle trips, he would take boat trips, steamboat trips down the Volga and other rivers, he would uh, take hiking trips uh, and uh, uh, probably other modes of transportation I'm not thinking of, but just whatever was available to visit, to visit, to get to know this land that he had always loved in theory and now could, could uh, visit in person. And these miniatures, this first cycle of miniatures, there are two cycles, one from the 1950s slash 60s, and then there's one after his return home to Russia uh, in the mid-90s, mid to late-90s. This, this first cycle of miniatures was born of, those, of that engagement, of that thrill of discovering his own country for the first time, and a profoundly poignant and painful intersection of still largely unspoiled natural beauty with a absolute derelict, wasted uh, condition of Soviet reality, anything touched, touched by man. In some cases polluted, in some cases left to shrivel and die. Uh, left to rot. And that's, uh, I guess, the overarching theme of these miniatures is the contrast. And I suppose one could 
discuss it on many levels and using uh, and thinking in different layers uh, about what they mean. But on the most fundamental level, it's that encounter with nature and with the old traditions of Russia that somehow in, in some ways perhaps continue to live, haven't been fully crushed yet. And then on the other hand, uh, the, the, the stark reality of what, of what is today. So this first miniature is called along the Oka. Oka is one of the great Russian rivers. Your students of geography will know that. And I think you have the texts there, so feel free to follow along if that makes it easier, um, or don't if you don't, uh, but the option is available. So, this is early 60s along the Oka. When you travel the by roads of central Russia, you begin to understand the secret of the pacifying Russian countryside. It is in the churches. They trip up the slopes, ascend the high hills, come down to the broad rivers like princesses in white and red. They lift their bell towers, graceful, shapely, lovingly carved. High over mundane timber and thatch, they nod to each other from afar. From villages that are cut off and invisible to each other, they soar to the same heaven. And wherever you wander in the fields or meadows, however far from habitation, you are never alone. From over the hayricks, the wall of you find that not the living, but the dead greeted you from afar. The crosses were knocked off the roof or twisted out of place long ago. The dome has been stripped and there are gaping holes between its rusty ribs. Weeds grow on the roofs and in the cracks in the walls. Usually the graveyard, churchyard, has not been kept up. The crosses have been flattened, the graves churned. The icons over the altar have been smeared by the rains of decades and defaced by obscene inscriptions. On the porch, there are barrels of lubricating oil and a tractor is turning towards them or else a truck has backed into the church doorway to pick up some sacks. In one church, there is the shutter of lathes. Another is locked up and silent. In another and another, there are clubs. Let us attain high milk yields. A poem about the sea, a heroic deed, posters, it's gaudy socialist realist art that's hanging, clubs that used to be churches. People have always been selfish and often unkind, but the evening chimes used to ring out, floating over villages, fields, and woods, reminding men that they must abandon the trivial concerns of this world and give time and thought to eternity. These chimes, now preserved for us just in the olden chants, raised people up and prevented them from sinking down to all fours. Our forefathers put all that was finest in themselves, all their understanding of life, into these stones, into these bell towers. Ram it in, Vitka. Give it a bash. Don't be shy. Film show at 6 o'clock, dancing at 8. So as you make your way, and that's about as long as these miniatures are. Some of them are much shorter. But they're just snippets. Pictures of what he saw and how he perceived it and how he experienced it. And many of them do uh, return to those, to, those, to those themes of 
despoilment and decay. Okay. He couldn't write miniatures in the West. He didn't know why. He just couldn't and, 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 and he didn't. But when he returned home after 20 years of exile, this was in 1994, he all of a sudden felt, felt the urge and the capacity to revisit this peculiar form. And so he wrote another cycle. The, uh, I, I neglected to mention the original cycle is 18 of uh, miniatures, and this new cycle in the 90s is 14, for a total of 32. And, and you can read them in, in a half an hour or, or, or whatever, a very, very, very brief period of time. So this one also is uh, inspired by, by his travels, because when he returned to Russia, again, he wasn't expecting to be, to be missing for 20 years. When he came back, he wanted and was afforded the opportunity to, again, to travel around and to, he was invited, of course, everywhere to come and speak here and come and speak there and meet with university students and meet with uh, all kinds of groups and, and associations. And uh, he took some of those opportunities as his strength allowed and, and, and as his time allowed and uh, part, partly, of course, out of a sense of, uh, of, of, of duty and, 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 and of, uh, hoping to help answer people's questions such as he, could and, and just uh, for, for those kinds of reasons, but partly also he was he wanted to visit some other places like all of us do in the end. We want to visit places we haven't been uh, before we're gone, and so he was able to go to certain other parts of Russia or specific towns or landmarks that uh, that he had never seen, and and one of these is uh, the bell tower of Kalyazin. Kalyazin is a, just a tiny little place uh, on the Volga River, the northern reaches of it. And, well, I, I'll, I'll let him describe what he saw there. The bell tower. Whoever seeks to grasp, to compass at a glance, our Russian land, before it is finally submerged, should take the time to look upon the bell tower of Kalyazin. It once stood in the thick of a flourishing trade town, hard by the cathedral, near the covered market of the Gestini Dvor, and streets of two-story merchant houses ran down onto the square at its feet. And no prophet could then have foretold that in its eighth century of life, this ancient town, survivor of successive onslaughts by Tatars and Poles, would be deliberately submerged at the ignorant behest of petty tyrants, Brezhnev, leaving two-thirds of the town beneath the Volga. The Bolsheviks begrudged the money for a second dam, which would have saved it. Two-thirds submerged why the entire town of Mologa is lying down at the bottom of the river, too. Kalyazin, swallowed up like the fabled city of Kitij, lies in ten fathoms of water. And if you stand today at the river's edge, no effort of the imagination can raise this reluctant Atlantis from the abyss. But what survives of the drowned town is its tall, graceful bell tower. The cathedral was blasted apart or dismantled to provide the building bricks for our radiant future. Yet for some reason they didn't get round to flattening the bell tower. Didn't lay a finger on it. You'd think it was a protected landmark. And here it stands, jutting out of the water, its white brickwork built to last. It's six tiers tapering as they rise, one and a half of them submerged. In the last few years, they have been tipping rubble against its sides to form a protective platform around the base. Here it stands, with no sign of a tilt or twist, thrusting heavenward the open work pattern of its five visible tiers, 
surmounted by an onion dome spire. And on the spire, what miracle is this? The cross survives intact. Bulky, Volga steamers forge by, yet when viewed from afar, they reach barely halfway up the first of the bell tower's exposed tiers. And their wake sends the waves slapping against its white walls, while from the decks, Soviet passengers gape at the tower, just as they have these 50 years. You roam the surviving little streets, dismal, mutilated, and still showing here and there the buckled hovels of those first hastily resettled flood victims. Along the false new embankment, the women of Kalyazin, devoted as ever to the renowned gentleness and purity of the Volga water, are trying to rinse out their linen. The ravaged town lingers on, a broken stump, more dead than alive, with but a handful of its once splendid buildings left intact. Yet even amidst this desolation, cheated and abandoned as they are, people have no choice but to go on living. And where are they to live but here? And still for them, as for all who have once beheld this marvel, the bell tower stands like the hope we cherish, like the prayer we raise on high. No, the Lord will not permit all of Russia to be plunged. So many of the same themes as in 30, 35 years earlier, but perhaps in a depiction of these two churches, shall we say, the church that he sees along the Oka, and now this, okay, the church has been destroyed, the cathedral, but the bell tower stands. Perhaps a sense of that hope, a sense of some renewal. But emerged and not submerged and hoping to forge a path forward. So I wanted to share these two with you because of the echoes right, and the, the way that one echoes the other uh, and, uh, and the way that ultimately even uh, in uh, the very difficult circumstances of a, of, of a, of a Russia emerging from, from communism, uh, he, sees, uh, he sees despair but he, but he has hope uh, and, or at least he hopes for hope. And uh, on that note, I would like to invite John Haig to return to the stage, and, and, and uh, we will see what he thinks about all this and, and then what all of you think. Thank you very much. Thank you very much again, Ignat Solzhenitsyn. I want to remind the audience, this is really your night. This is not going to be um, a, a monologue here. Um, so within minutes, I'll be inviting you up to the microphones. Um, I had an opportunity to hear uh, Enoch speak in an interview three and a half years ago um, at the University of Notre Dame. And every time that he spoke on stage, it was an interview it seemed like the collective audience leaned forward. And then when the interviewee spoke, it seemed like there was sort of a, a push back. And I noticed this physical move throughout the audience, and I want to make sure that doesn't happen tonight. But what it caused me to... Um, That's an order. 
<laughs> really what it, I, and I'll say this to students, um, it struck me that I, I want to go talk to this gentleman. Uh, of course I knew his father's work, um, but was just in, as engaged by Alexander's son. So um, students, when you really want to talk to somebody, sometimes you wait in the lobby when nobody's around and you wait till they make a cup of tea. And, uh, and introduce yourself. So uh, that's how it happened, and that was three and a half years ago. And I proposed that we might be able to um, uh, invite uh, you know, Social Needs in here. And uh, two years ago, we had it set up in April of 2020 that uh, he was going to be on this stage performing as a Steinway artist and uh, performing on one of our great Steinway uh, concert pianos. And uh, we had it all set up. In fact, I had just gone through a couple of the emails that I, that I was exchanging with folks during that time and colleagues. And um, from a theology professor, and you're here tonight, on February 20, uh, sorry, February 2nd, 2020, sends an email to me saying, I just saw a student reading The Social Needs and Reader in the library. The world is already becoming a better place. That's February 2020. The world's becoming a better place. <clears throat> so think about in, in the, of course we, uh, that concert did not happen uh, for many reasons. And then over the course of that summer, uh, it was quite an active summer in the United States and, and around the world. And um, we, we weren't sharing a lot of, uh, of emails back and forth, but uh, because we knew this was postponed, we'd have to get back to it. and. Um, However, there was a Supreme Court ruling in June of 2020, I won't get into, but uh, I was uh, a little bit depressed in, in the, the office here working in the summer, so I sent a, a quick note to um, Ignat asking, uh, uh, gosh, where are we? And uh, his response, I want to share just a, a quick blurb, because most of us were listening to Talking Heads, we were listening to, uh, not the band, but uh, listening to podcasts, we were listening to you know, news and trying to find gurus everywhere we could to find out what are the next steps in a, um, uh, something of a cratering atmosphere. Here's the response uh, in part in the email from Ignat it, uh, in June of 2020. It's an important moment to have courage and at least not to participate in lies as my father implored. Let evil come into this world if it must, but not through me. A seemingly modest but ultimately magnificent goal. He goes on to say, to free the human spirit in times like these, great music and great literature. So St. Paul and Shakespeare and Beethoven remain our dearest, most needed friends and mentors. Do not despair, please, courage, no more than ever. At a time when all, all of us were hearing, well, become more politically engaged, uh, go into local government, um, maybe apply to work for the county health department or something, right? Or uh, uh, get politically engaged, become an, an activist. And the response from Alexander Solzhenitsyn's son is, great music, great literature. OK, so that's what we did. I'd like to ask you, uh, in times like that, uh, you proposed art as an answer. The art of literature, of course, and, and music. And St. Paul, of course, who is always depicted with a sword. So please. <laughs> Not to say that the that the political and 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 uh, social engagements are not worthy paths because they certainly are and they're certainly necessary. And in general, politics gets a bad uh, reputation in our day and age because it's always condemned as a as a dirty business, which undoubtedly it is. But it seems to me it's less dirty than uh, other ways of solving disputes uh, and, of, and of deciding who wins and who loses and so forth. So, uh, so it's not to, 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 to denigrate those, those essential spheres of activities. But may, maybe just to say that when push comes to shove, when we are faced, when, when we are faced with death, which uh, we, we all are at every moment. The only question is, do we choose to 
engage with it, not in a more, some kind of a morbid or, or obsessive way, but as an absolutely uh, ineluctable fact of our existence, as, in fact, the central fact of our existence on Earth uh, that everybody can agree with, right? We know that uh, death and taxes, right? So, so it's coming, whatever your persuasions. We know it's coming. So if, if and to quote my father, if man, I mentioned that earlier, if man were born to be happy, he would not be born to die. So not to say that we shouldn't seek happiness and we shouldn't appreciate happiness when it comes our way, but that there must be more, there must be more to life than, than um, our, our momentary needs and our, certainly our material needs. That there is, uh, there are some questions that that uh, that linger forever, and there's never a right time to. There's ne there's, there's never uh, there, there's never a time when they, when they don't when they stop mattering. There's never a time when something when some external and by external meaning something that isn't happening inside our heart or inside our soul. Uh, therefore, no external events can, can be more important uh, than uh, our own individual journey and, of course, then how it affects uh, the people all around us. So, in that sense, yes, more than ever, it, it is those men and women who have, who have uh, risked everything on an individual level by sharing the most vulnerable, innermost, frailty of their, of their being, such as every artist, great artist does, such as Shakespeare, such as Beethoven, and, and supply your favorites, please. Uh, that's the inspiration uh, and the kind of example for us to, uh, to, examine, to examine our own lives, to examine our hearts, and, and there's never a, uh, a more pressing uh, agenda item than to do that. One more question, and then the, podi the, the microphone's here. Um, the poster for this event, as we've discussed it for years, is uh, your father's legacy. And um, for great reason, this is about your father's work and the questions over the course of the day, and uh, the, the uh, many hours of accessible interviews um, with you online are about your father. Um, but neither of you would be, neither of us would be sitting here um, as fathers um, without somebody taking care of what's going on behind the scenes all the time, and that is our, our wives with our, our children and, and um, uh, with the great support. So I would like to ask the, the first sort of official question. Um, would you tell us about your mother? My mother is uh, an, an extraordinary person of many, many varied kinds of gifts and uh, abilities. She, it's difficult. It's difficult for a great man or a great woman, but it's difficult to find for a great person to find uh, a, a worthy spouse. I suppose it's difficult for anybody, but it's especially difficult for perhaps for a person like like my father. And uh, she 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 was there. She was it. He found her, and she found him, and uh, she was perfect for him because of, of course, just their, their relationship and their, and their love for each other. Uh, and that was a, 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 as happy a marriage of a, as, as, I, as I've seen, as, I've, as I know about. Uh, and, and so God, God bless them for that. Um, but um, and, uh, she was so much more than just a fantastic wife and then a, fan, a fantastic mother for, for his children, for my, for my siblings and, my, and myself. Uh, but she was also really a companion in his fight, in his fight against the regime and in his artistic journey. Not to say that she somehow uh, 
she never seeks credit for, for, for it. She doesn't, she doesn't put herself forward. And, but, but she was instrumental in believing in him and believing in what he was doing. In when he would come to her with a seeking, and there were many, many life-altering decisions to, to make during those, especially during those uh, late 60s, early 70s. And whenever he would come to her seeking worry that seeking advice and worry that she would suggest as a as a as a partner as a mother uh, would suggest a more prudent course she always always said this is what you believe let's do it do it do what you think and come what come what may and so she had this provided that extraordinary support then she is a trained uh, mathematician, but by, by profession, but by, much like my father, mathematician by training, a writer by, 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 by inspiration and by vocation. Uh, she's not a writer, but she is a great, great literary uh, critic and, and uh, feeler of language and of style, of the poetry even in prose, and just of the, of the of she, she's a master of the Russian language, in her, own, in her own right. And so as such, she provided not only this uh, uh, natural kind of feedback that, that, that uh, a wife or spouse would, but particularly in the conditions of exile, which first and foremost for a writer meant a kind of the dry uh, uh, desert of, 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 of language, because uh, English is, is, is uh, one of the greatest languages in the world, but it's not his language, it's not the language he's writing in. And so it doesn't matter what, it's not Russian. And so he's torn away from his readers, he's torn away from his, from his even if the readers were underground, even if his works were only published in some is not, which is self, uh, self-published, the, the old meaning of self-published, meaning you typed it in the typewriter and you gave it to somebody you trusted, and said here you can read this, borrow it for a night, give it back to me and don't let anybody see us. So in these conditions, uh, of, of freedom and of, and, of, and, of, and of prosperity and of everything easy uh, uh, in, in, in the West, for a writer to be in those conditions was very difficult because he had no feedback, because he had no readers uh, in, in his language, and it's, again, before publication. She was his first reader, she was his editor, she was his, uh, 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 really his, his, his uh, muse in, 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 in every sense of small and large of that term. And all of his works that were written or heavily revised uh, in some cases uh, in the West, such as The Red Wheel, most notably, uh, there is extraordinary documentary evidence that I remember from my childhood, but that exists now in the archives and that will be already is being researched and so forth of uh, her comments on the margins of every single page. She would type his manuscripts, first of all. She would type them up. Uh, and, and, and then after there was a clean copy, something to work with, a type script, she would then write in a certain color her comments on the margin. Say, this passage is getting too long. This character has to be fleshed out. These were just her opinions. He wasn't obligated to follow them, and very often he didn't. But most of the time he did. Most of the time he did. And there was this back and forth, and they never, hardly ever discussed any of it in, in, in person. Uh, because it was too, too facile, and it didn't, didn't, didn't allow for proper consideration. So she would write in the margins, and uh, usually one of us kids would ferry the, 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 those few pages over to his office. And office, he was sometimes in a building a few hundred feet away. So we fer ferry him these, these, these pages, the, the, the most recent five pages, uh, three pages, ten pages. And he would review her comments and he would respond. He would argue, say, no, this is why I've done it this way. Or he would say, you're right. Or, and the, the, so the back and forth, uh, and sometimes multiple times. And then he would, when he was ready, he would write another draft. And then she might have more comments. And so she was, in his own words, just invaluable to him, particularly in those, in those conditions. So 
She's a she's a she's she's a an, a, an important literary personage, in, in, kind of in her own right, and at the same time she's a she's a great mom, and uh, uh, and she was I believe a, a, an amazing uh, partner in his in his journey. So God bless her. God bless her indeed. At this moment, I want to invite you to come up to the the microphones. Those of you who have questions, um, I don't know if those are live. You might check them, tap on them or something. something when you come up, uh, we would generally just alternate side to side and take questions. Um, Is there a bonus for the first person who asks a question sometime? <laughs> we could put a 20 There's up, a volunteer um, there, okay. Microwave <laughs> on the microphone. Um, I do. Well, this is the last thing I say. Okay, good. We'll have somebody at the microphone. Um, in along the Oka, would what would your father's response be? I, I had this image flash into my head as he is reading that. The empty church is sort of the, the barrenness of the church, but it seems like the churches have, uh, to some extent, baptized. This is a bit of an analogy, a little bit of a stretch. Baptized the earth certain sense. It's not an indelible mark, but it is a mark nonetheless that they have not been able to remove. And it hit me, is this not, I mean, what would your father say to someone who says, this seems like a soul, a baptized soul living in mortal sin, or not living in mortal sin. It's in the landscape, it's there, ready to be. Well, sin, sin, sin or, 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 more sinned against than sinning, says Lear. Right? Uh, it's it's a it's a ch churches. I suppose the physical churches, in particular, but but even more broadly, the the, the church's institution is is a is a bridge from the human to the divine. Is a is a is the nexus where 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 they intersect, perhaps. Uh, that's above my pay grade, but 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 that's what it seems to me, and 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 a, and a physical church would be a manifestation of that. So, uh, but I guess I, w I would read it as this best that we could offer to God, that we could offer to 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 our belief in God by 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 creating, and you would know better than anyone in, uh, in architecture, but creating. Monuments made by hands, but that are meant to elevate elevate our souls to uh, in that direction, uh, and then to have it by those same or by of course new new generation human hands desecrate and 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 despoil, uh, and so uh, the idea of a church lying in, in ruins and being profaned by all those uh, types of uh, in all those different ways that you heard him describe, is a is a particularly painful allegory uh, for for the uh, for the for the tragedy that befell Russia more broadly in her in her the devastation, of course, of her people first and foremost, and the, the murder of her people by by. <laughs> By, by, by each other, ultimately. So I think a church, that, that's what I think. Okay, thank you. I, I was told there was gonna be a 20. <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> your father you know, raised a musician. Um, he himself was a man of letters, your mother was um, you know, you just described her kind of like excellence in culture. What are some ways that um, your family made space? And I ask this in a selfish way because you know I'm thinking about you know I'm thinking about how to raise our kids. What are ways you know that your family made space for that kind of cultural formation um, that uh, that allowed you to be this home where kind of great works are written and and beauty was something that you fell in love with. Did you say need space? Yeah, made yeah. space. Made, made space, yeah. yeah. Well, maybe start with physical space. We, we were fortunate to have space in the rural Vermont, 
I mean, everybody has room. Uh, nobody's elbowing each other. There's split, right? There's just a, a, lot, a lot of trees and not many people. Uh, so to start with, and uh, secondly, we were in a spacious old country home. Lots of rooms, and 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 then uh, my father built this study for him, a separate structure for him to lay out all his uh, research materials uh, for the Red Wheel. And for the first time in his life, he could have as much space as he wanted. He could have eight tables, as more or less what he had of uh, strewn with papers, but in a very, in a very, in a way that made sense to him. Uh, and I think having, s for him, I know it was essential to have that space physically and that silence for him. He wasn't picky in his daily habits and his, and his preferences. And, but one of the things he really needed, uh, certainly as he got older, was, was quiet to be able to think and to be able to write. And I think that I know he was grateful and, 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 uh, to have that. And then I think, I haven't really thought of it, but that question is, is true, that we as a family had space for the reasons of, or, or in the ways that I just mentioned, to, to read think, uh, to, of course, to discuss together and to, for us to learn from our parents and, and, and eventually from each other, and then maybe even that, that our parents could learn something from, from us once in a while. Uh, who knows? But, uh, but to have that um, opportunity to not to take things too quickly. And as I get older, I, 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 va I value that more and more, not because I feel less sharp than I did uh, uh, as a kid or as a, as a, as a youth, but because, uh, maybe because I, I, I sense that I, I have a better understanding of the complexities of life and of the difficult, of, of, all, the, of all these difficult questions, some of which you refer. So uh, in, in, in our fast forward to 2022, as we are now, uh, probably more than ever, this, we talked about that this afternoon a little bit, but in this, in this constant noise of our daily life and the constant, and the, literally the noise, the notifications on your phone and the, con the constant assault, uh, how can anybody think of anything but the present moment? And how can any, anyone think of what to teach their kids? And, 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 and how can the kids themselves process anything that's lasting uh, in that environment. So it's not to say we should, we should somehow go backwards or we should not enjoy these extraordinary fruits uh, of, of, of our own invent inventiveness, but, but to now more than ever to make, to make, to make room uh, to hear and, and, and perceive things uh, that are impalpable. Please. Hello, thank you so much for being here. Um, just following up on what you had just said, you yourself are a very successful musician. Um, I'm a member of the music department here as a student, uh, so are many of the students here. Um, how is music for you and how you've experienced it in your career um, a way of entering into that silence that it's a place where heaven meets earth? Um, and earlier at the, the 4 p.m. talk, you had mentioned that um, your father never prescribed anything that a person should do something, but um, if you could, if you could say how music should impact every person's life, how would you, how would you say that? Well, you know, the, the, there is a piece written by a great American avant-gardist, John Cage, and. Now I'm, I'm embarrassed that I won't get the title. I think it's 433. That somebody can correct me if I'm wrong. It's 433. And 433 stands for four minutes and 33 seconds. And it's a piece for solo piano. And when we come on stage to perform this piece, bell, down the piano, count four minutes and 33 seconds. When that appointed time is up, we bow and we leave. Now, many people are scandalized 
by, by, this, by the whole notion of it, understandably. It seems like, you know, I paid for this ticket to hear some music and, you know, what, am I, what is going on here? Uh, and, and, but, you know, the more uh, I, I, I think about it, I haven't performed that piece, although I may yet, uh, <laughs> but I do think, actually, there's, it's something quite marvelous. Uh, uh, maybe there's, there's, there's a, a gimmick, in, of course, uh, involved there, but at the root of it, John Cage used to say that the most important part of music is silence. And Mozart used to say that the most important part of his music is what happens between the notes. And so somehow, and I'm sure great philosophers have, have spoken from their own point of view about what, how music is born and how, how, it, how, it, how it comes to, to the surface inside us and then actually in the physical world. And so I guess just to make sure that we have, again, that word space that was suggested, that we, that we have space to allow for silence, even if it's just that couple of seconds before a concert begins. And uh, it's so necessary because without that hearing what the silence sounds like, uh, we can't really hear then what the, what the music will sound on top of that silence. We need to establish uh, the baseline as sound engineers. What, what room sound? What this room, not, for example, what this room sounds like right now, none of us know because there's way too much noise going on and I'm chatting and we're talking and we're, but and if we were to really just be quiet and listen, and even then it would take a few seconds before we could start to hear what actually it sounds like, and it's never nothing, it's never a void. It's always something. Uh, but that is the uh, sp spiritual and even physical condition that it seems to me we need to be, that we need to attain in order to than be open to, to music. And so that's, I guess that's my, if, if that's my only advice, is just to make sure that, that uh, for many, many people don't need that injunction, don't need that suggestion. They're, I would venture to guess most of you are, 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 are love music already and just and would like to listen to more music if you had more time or go to more concerts if you, so, so, uh, so I, I think most people don't really need help there, but maybe, but maybe people who somehow are not, have not been, have not noticed what a gift music can be. Uh, perhaps by allowing that, uh, by allowing, uh, by allowing themselves to quiet their breast, uh, can find. And those of us who already love music, can deepen our engagement in that same way. Thank you. Uh, in 1983, I was at a small college, uh, Catholic college in St. Louis and they assigned us the blue caps from your father's book, The Gulag. And so thank you for carrying on that legacy. I, there's, a, there's a special place for Solzhenitsyn in America. And, and uh, I tell people all the time, most people don't listen, but I, I, love, I love the legacy of he needs to be heard. Um, I've heard that he had the smallest handwriting on planet Earth, is that true? I'm not sure I've seen smaller. <laughs> But as so much, and thank you very much for those, I, I, those, That's my, those, uh, those just words. after you responded to that, just the question. You have a follow, okay. Okay, I, and yep. the reason, I, now he, I understood that he did that because not only lack of pen and paper, but because he had it was to hide it. And, and my comment, or just I wanted a response from you, uh, uh, perhaps, is, is there hope for us as we have this amazing ability to communicate, we don't do it anymore. And so we're all more, isol more and more, it seems to me, isolated and writing on smaller and smaller writing. And uh, do you think he would be hopeful for our situation here in the West? Because it's pretty grim. And so that's, that's the, the extent of my question, if you could respond to that. He called himself an... Uh he went, went at, I mean, he wasn't making up names for himself, but when he was pressed on that kind of an issue, at, at one point in the interview with the BBC in 94, uh, in the year of his return, 
says, you know, I, I guess I'm an optimistic pessimist. And it is interesting that, uh, and it's encouraging, that much of what he saw in his life was difficult and painful and awful. From the earliest, from the earliest beginnings, his, 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 uh, he was born the same the year after the revolution. So, so, so he's the twin of that uh, of that Soviet Soviet uh, enterprise uh, in in, in uh, it, uh, chronologically, and then through, of course, that some of the things I described and you know about, and then and then including in in in, in the new, in the new Russia emerging from communism in, a, in, a, in in such an ugly way in the 1990s. Uh, but it seems at every stage he finds reason to hope, and he finds reason because it, it, uh, he finds reason to believe in the human capacity to repent, to forgive, to renew one, oneself, to renew one's purpose. It's never too late for any of us. And I think he, he, I think he really believed that. And so uh, his works, and I think when you read his works, whether it's an, an essay, whether it's the Liechtenstein speech that we examine today, um, uh, uh, whether it's a, 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 a momentous work like the Gulag Archipelago, it always, seems to end on, on, a, on an ascent. It always seems to end on a, on a, on a, on a people close. When you re, if you read everybody I know, I've never heard otherwise, um, unless of course anything's possible, but anyone who's read the, the whole Gulag Archipelago finishes it and, and feels hopeful about humanity, feels emboldened about the possibility of the human spirit, about, instead of being uh, now admittedly if you don't make it through uh, then you may have a different and I've certainly had people say oh I read the first two chapters you know, I couldn't handle it anymore that was, and that's also understandable because it's not for the faint of heart uh, but if you persevere you're rewarded uh, so am, uh, did I answer your question or did yeah. I get off yeah, I, I appreciate off it uh, yeah, so, so, so I think he would have I'm not sure he would be particularly encouraged by anything specifically manifesting itself in, in, in the Western world, or for that matter, in Russia. Um, uh, but but um, maybe it's a kind of hoping against hope. Yeah, my, my mother would say it's a messy world out there. <laughs> yes, it is. Thank you. Jamie. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, I'm sure that you've heard this a million times, but your father's writing has inspired me almost every day for 20 years. I never thought I'd get this close to you know, his family or part of him. My question is, to some extent, follow up on the last one. One of the things that I really admire about your father's spirit is that he always loved his country. Um, Americans think that once people come here, they'll just stay here, because mm -hmm. we're perfect, and, and no. <laughs> uh, he wanted to go back to Russia. Uh, despite he being unjustly imprisoned, cruelly treated himself, and then seeing a terrible corrupt regime and what it had done to, to millions of people, he still loved his country and his land. I wondered if you could give us any advice or share anything, like what was the source of that love? How, how did he keep that alive uh, for us so that we can have that same love for our country and not, um, not lose hope or, or be like, oh, this stupid government, I don't believe in I don't believe in us anymore. I don't believe in our land or our people. Yeah, anything you could say about where that love came from and how he sustained it through the years. That would be great to hear. That's a wonderful question. Source, I, do, I don't know if I can define a source, identify it, explain it. I do know that I've lived in different countries, met many, many people, of course, I travel a lot. 
uh, in, in my, in my uh, line of work. Um, I've never met, for what it's worth, I've never met, I've never met someone who loved his country the way, the way my father did. Um, and I think it is, so that's just to say, I think it's, he, he loved this country to an unusual degree. And, not to, and, and I know that all of you, you know, I think most people do. Most, most people do love their country. But, uh, so for him it was just, it was almost physical. It was almost, and so he could never, he was sort of, people sometimes would say, well, why are you happy or are you, and, and he would say, well, how can, how can I be happy if my country's unhappy? And how can I be happy if, if if, uh, so in other words, maybe I'm healthy or maybe, and, uh, or, or, or my family and I'm happy with my, my children are growing up well and or my, I love my wife, but, but, but how can I be happy if, so in, this, in that sense he was never happy in his life because he was, his heart ached so, and, then, and Russia gave him very little opportunity to, to feel that yes, things are really great now. <laughs> it, it, it really never was great in his lifetime. And, the, and, the, and I think he, but he was a very, I would also say a very, uh, his patriotism is very consciously considered. And that is to say that it was, by, I, I don't want to give the impression because his love was so strong that it was, as love tends to be, blind. We really love someone, uh, we, we don't notice the fall. Love is blind. No, his love was far from blind. And of course, uh, over the years, he has received so much abuse from, uh, from unthinking Russian kind of Soviet at the time, and then now, you know, Russian uh, supposed patriots who say, how dare you, you know, how dare you say anything bad about our, you know, our country's the best, our country's perfect. Uh, I mean, in America, what is familiar with that idea, hey, we're number one, we're the best, you know, and uh, of course America has more reason than many to, 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 to have that point of view, but he thought patriotism should be considered. He thought that patriotism should be, and he, he tried to define it. And he, he tried to define it, first of all, as something that is not nationalism. And again, without getting into semantics, because people may have different, their own definitions of what those words mean. But for him, uh, nationalism was a negative term. Nationalism was uh, implied in, I'm a nationalist, I'm an American. What does that mean, American nationalist? Russian? Well, it means, Again, not to put words in somebody else's mouth. For him, it meant putting, elevating your country at the expense of others. The American nationalists, because America's great and other countries aren't. Or Russia's great and other countries aren't. For him, it was appreciating and loving what's good about his country, but not hesitating to criticize what, what is evil or wicked or, or even just lacking. So that kind of a, so it's a thinking, it's an open-eyed, uh, pa patriotism. Uh, that is the only kind that is really worth something. Because the kind of blind of no matter what, you know, no matter what, what, what my country does, I'm going to support it. That's, that's a bit mindless. That's a bit frightening. Uh, even though the, 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 the sentiment is un under understandable. But, and, and then the conversely, the kind of, the kind of no matter what, what, what my country does, I, I, I hate it. Or, or I, I want it to fail. And one does see that. So, but, but, and the source of it, I would just say the source of it is, 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 is Russia herself, for all her faults, for all her shortcomings, for all the tragedies and the self-inflicted wounds and the wounds she's inflicted on others. Uh, but, but the love of the Russian, of what it means to be Russian. He tried to define, by the way, he, in, 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 in a wonderful uh, essay, The Russian Question, which has connotations in Russian history and so, but basically, Basically, what is Russia and who is, and, and, who, and, and by the way, who is Russian? What does it mean to be Russian? And, and, and I think it could be applied to other countries or other cultures, but of course he didn't presume to do that, but he just asked that question and tried to answer it with respect to Russia. He said, you know, it's not about blood. He said, well, you know, what percentage are you, are you Russian? It's not about blood. It's not about passport. It's not about residence. It's about your orientation, your spiritual orientation. Where is, what, where is home? What culture is home to you? And language, religion, physical space, kind of what, what, so you don't have to even be Russian to be a patriot of Russia. 
uh, or, or you don't have to be American per se, right? There, how many people in Russia, by the way, in the Soviet times, worshipped, I mean, not just in Russia, all over the world, as you all know, worshipped America as never having set foot there, here, and not knowing a word of English, but the city and the hill. And not to say that that makes them American, but just to say that that is so much more important. Where your heart is, they're there, there. right? So. This is going to sound terrible, but we will take one last oh. question. But we're going to take the other well, questions quick, in uh, another location. One, one more question. Ah, okay. All right. Yeah, give, um, if they're not too long, we can handle a, a, a couple. Okay, okay, good. Of course, good. the answers have to be short, too. Be so. Because we do want... We do want the discussion to, to continue over at Holy Grounds, and, and, and we'll sort of we'll have a mingling and a, and a parade over there. Um, so, but please. You can make this answer as short as you want, but um, thank you so much for being here. I uh, worked my way through the Gulag Archipelago last summer and was very moved by it. And um, one thing that really struck me was that your father obviously understood. Uh, human nature maybe more than anyone um, and human nature in the face of suffering and especially in like good times and bad times the way um, human nature responds in men and the way it responds in women um, so my question would be uh, just kind of knowing the world that we live in today in America and uh, worldwide what um, what would he say and what would you say the world needs most from women today Oof. <laughs> Well, I just, I was just thinking, uh, feeling highly unqualified to answer. <laughs> I don't presume to say what he would say, uh, to know what he would say, or to s suggest what he would say. So I, I have to pass on that. For, for myself, I would just, uh, I would say that. Uh, Women have been throughout history a, a civilizing influence on men, uh, a, a tempering influence. Uh, there, there's there are very good reasons why why uh, that uh, for that old phrase, uh, my better half. And uh, I'm, I'm always a bit jarred when I hear women use that. I mean, it's charming but I think that, that can't be right, uh, you know? So we're the ones who should be saying that, it seems to me, and, that, and, 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 and I hope that's not too old-fashioned, but the point is just that uh, I think women uh, help, help uh, a, 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 apart from being the, the, the perfectly equal and, 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 and uh, you know, the perfect pair to, 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 to men uh, in, in the eyes of God, in the eyes of sort of in nature in every respect. But, but um, I, I just think from the point of view of men, uh, we, uh, we, uh, we would be lost uh, without those, that ben beneficent influence that women uh, manage to uh, bestow upon us even as, 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 as they pursue their own their own lives and their own, their own, their own paths. So, uh, I guess that's that's uh, that's the best I can do. I, I appreciate your question. I appreciate your uh, what you said earlier very much. Shall we do two more? One, and okay. then the very quick okay, one. Let's do that. This is a good one. So, okay. So it's very obvious that your father uh, suffered greatly during his stay in the Gulag. Would you say that suffering is a key component in making such caliber of art? Yes. <laughs> well, well, that wasn't supposed to be a, a crowd pleaser. <laughs> you know, in music, we, we talk about that all the time. And I, I, I don't know. Of course, how fair that is, and how how uh, if blanket judgments are, are 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 appropriate. Blanket judgments are usually not appropriate, and yet they do help us. They help us to navigate the the, the world. 
one of my very, very favorite composers, uh, Felix Mendelssohn, lived a uniquely, that's probably misusing the term, but, but a rarely uh, seen, happy, prosperous, safe, acclaimed life as a, as a, as a, not just as a composer, but as an extraordinary conductor, extraordinary pianist, the general, one of the really luminaries of European cultural life, period. But some people say that, that Mendelssohn doesn't quite plumb the absolute depths of, of, of the human experience, maybe because he was too fortunate. It seems a cruel thing to say, and again, for me, it's, it's, it's but, but I, I don't disagree with that. I just, I just think that there are different people are given different experiences, and, and, and I, I, I love, I, I don't just respect Mendelssohn, I love Mendelssohn so much, but, but that's a topic that comes up. And conversely, with composers, the majority of whom, it seems, suffered various uh, and deprivations and, and spiritually or physically, uh, it seems to translate. We look at Dostoevsky and his time in, in his Siberian penal system, which of course was child's play compared to the Soviet system, but nonetheless, nothing that you would, we would wish upon each other. Uh, and Dostoevsky, that, that, that's what changed him. That's what made Dostoevsky into the visionary prophet that he became. Uh, Solzhenitsyn himself was deeply cognizant of that turning in his life. He explains that in, 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 the, in the archipelago, and he says, this is why I say, bless you, prison, for having been in my life. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a paradox, but and yet it makes so much sense. So in short, yes, I think there is a strong correlation, but not to say that great art cannot be produced. Otherwise, maybe it's just a little more difficult. And thank, and thank goodness for that, too. Thank you. Hello. Um, to follow up with another question about music, or a question about music, um, in talking about joy and, and turning to the arts in times of hardships, I was just wondering what's your favorite, or some of your favorite um, pieces of music to experience, like playing, conducting, or just listening to? Well, you said joy, and, and I suppose it's different, different pieces for different kinds of experience. Joy, I mean, why don't we start with the, with the Ninth Symphony of Beethoven, and, and also with the suffering, and so the, 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 the really catharsis uh, that is, uh, is on display and, and that we all experience when we live through that piece, whether we're listening to it, whether we're conducting it, whether we're playing in it, or just even thinking about it, uh, a journey from darkness to light. ability of even the most uh, unhappy human to conceive of joy. Uh, anything we conceive cannot be taken away. Anything we conceive is more real, is as real as anything we experience, isn't it? And, and so in that sense, uh, a, piece like, a piece like the Ode to Joy. Uh, Mendelssohn, Mendelssohn who was so happy uh, in his family life, in his professional life, in his um, spiritual life. Uh, his music is full of so much joy and so much positivity and so much positive reinforcement of uh, 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 gratitude for, for, for the bounties of this world. Haydn also actually had a quite, a, quite, a, quite a reasonably happy life and Haydn ends every, every manuscript with LD. And exactly, this is, this is the place to come to. No, a lot of musicians have no idea that LD would allow us there. And, and, and uh, so, of course, when, when one composes in that spirit, uh, the world is a, better, is a better place. And the music can't help but reflect that inner harmony, that inner sense of peace, that inner sense of 
everything's in, is in the right place, even if a certain detail of our lives may not be. So, and there are pieces that, of course, cast us into profound despair. Uh, so, so, and 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 everything in between. Of course, music has has the totality of our of our experience. Uh, Brought to brought to life, brought to a way of uh, being shared with everybody. But uh, but uh, it's 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 nice to think about pieces that really elevate us through that. The one of the through through that emotion of joy, through that which, going back to something that was said earlier today, is best experienced together, isn't it? Uh, joy alone is can be special, but it's not. That's why we we gather. We hear music to experience music, and for obviously for for uh, all, any other reason, life is better when we're when we're together. Okay, well, what, that's I guess that's where we finish. That's a, that's a we one. we can finish with my <laughs> with uh, our, our uh, colleague's um, uh, statement that if somebody is reading the social needs and reader, the world is becoming a better place. We are doing uh, we're doing that here. So, thank you very much. One moment, please. <laughs> <laughs> When we bring someone on campus uh, who enlivens us and gives us joy, we like to give them a small gift. You have given us a large one. Thank you very much. Um, the Distinguished Speaker Series, a friend of your father. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you very much. If I'm permitted a, a one minute encore, <laughs> I'm used to giving encores. <laughs> and, and I'm going to walk out because this is, this is the pause, this is the break point before going over, everyone going over to Holy Grounds and continuing the conversation, the conviviality. Uh, Holy Grounds is best for those of you who are visiting out of town. Um, exit the theater, go up the stairs, and then take a left, and uh, you'll start to see a trail of people going to the Haverty building. And um, so, thank you very much. Actually, it was John who thought that it would be nice to just have a little, a little coda, a little nightcap. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is the last miniature that my father wrote, and it comes last in the uh, second set. There's actually a prayer that is then added to the end, but it was written, sort of it was super ad, ad, added later, but the last one he wrote is what I'd like you to read, uh, and just something to think about as we go off into the night, or even as we transfer to the, wherever we're going next. <laughs> Uh, just one of, my, one of my favorites. Remembrance of the Departed. It is an act bequeathed to us in deep wisdom by men of holiness. We come to understand its purpose not in vigorous youth amidst the company of loved ones, family, friends, but with age. Parents have passed, years now pass as well. Where go they? It seems unguessable, unfathomable, beyond our grasp. Yet, as with some foreordained clarity, it dawns for us, it glimmers. No, they have not vanished. 
and no more shall we learn of it while we live. But a prayer for their souls, it casts from us to them, from them to us, an impalpable arch of measureless breadth, yet effortless proximity. Why, here they are. You can almost touch them. Both unknowable are they, and as ever, so familiar. Except they have fallen back in years. Some were older than we, but now are younger. Focusing, you even inhale their answer, their hesitation, their warning. In exchange, you send them your own earthly warmth. Perhaps we too can help somehow. And a promise we shall meet.